you're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 29, 2019, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Principles of Safety. Our presenter is Dr. Lisa Schroeder. She's the Chief Medical Quality and Safety Officer at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 29th, uh, 2019, and we have the pleasure today to have Dr. Uh, Lisa Schroeder. Uh, she is one of the faculty here at uh, Children's Mercy, and will be giving us the talk on patient safety. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, for joining. Um, I did this talk last year also, and Dr. Dowling asked that we continue this series. One of the things that we've learned, and especially we learned through our clear visit the last couple of years, is that the residents and fellows have a lot of kind of varied experience with the patient safety world um, as far as any sort of formal training or understanding. And what we've learned nationally is that even when you have a great understanding of how the safety process works at one institution, that is not necessarily always transferable. So the basic concept should be, but the methods sometimes are a little bit different. So I thought what we would do is start with just kind of talking about what the kind of basis of patient safety is nationally and and more scientifically, and then move to talk a little bit more about what happens at children's with that. So, first of all, it's always a good starting point to think about making patient safety personal for you at some point. So, it's a little bit harder doing this um, remotely, but I just want you to think about three questions primarily. So, one, have you ever been harmed personally by a medical event, a medical error? These don't necessarily have to be major errors, but sometimes just minor things will cause some significant harm. Um, secondly, have you had a family member or a close friend ever harmed by a medical error? And while I can't see responses, I suspect at least somebody in the room has experienced that. Cora? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then maybe, you know, we've taken that personal to know that it has hit us, but maybe the more, most important question to think about as physicians and providers is, are you yourself personally capable of causing patient harm? And I would hope that everyone would answer yes to that. No matter how hard we try, absolutely every one of us is capable of causing harm. And one of the goals we have is to share and learn from any harm that is caused. So Children's Mercy belongs to a consortium called Solutions for Patient Safety. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of that, but it is a group of 20, oh, no, I can't remember now, about 120 children's hospitals who all band together to learn from each other. Their mantra is actually all teach, all learn. So we actually have weekly meetings where an institution will tell about safety events that may have happened there at their own place in a safe environment that's non-discoverable so that other hospitals can learn from events that happened um, somewhere else to hopefully try to put in processes to mitigate that happening there. So kind of a, a really cool thing. And then we have um, meetings biannually kind of in, in person to talk about as well. So. We all know that none of this is new data. I'm sure you've all heard a lot of this before, but the medical error statistics 
um, are very, very real. So the numbers currently are a little closer to that 98,000. So we probably approach about 100,000 Americans die annually from medical errors. Now, you may wonder why it seems like that number is not going down significantly compared to this data that um, is about 10 years old now on the slide. And a lot of that is actually awareness. So one of the things we've learned here at Mercy is while we started out our first year having about 14 to 15 serious safety events a year, we've been able to get that number down to uh, five our most current year, our most recent year. But the interesting thing is it's really hard to push the needle down. And what we're learning is we're finding out about events that we never knew about before. So a lot of safety events that were kind of just thought chalked up to bad luck, sick patient, when we really delve into them, we are finding some areas that the system could have improved that may have helped that. So the numbers not going down um, are disturbing, but not necessarily as distressing as you may think. So um, again, if you think about 44,000 people dying annually, that's equivalent to 1737 going down per year and killing all of the passengers. Um, estimates are about one death per every 378 admissions. And these are nationwide. These are not children's hospitals specifically. Um, fortunately for us, children's hospitals do have a slightly lower um, rate than the adult facilities. Um, interestingly, though, when you really look at is recommended care received by patients, and you look at all of the details of that recommended care, it really only happens about a little over half of the time. Um, when you look at some specifics there, it's as simple as a timeout procedure, timeout before procedures. About 80% of the time now that is occurring. And critical test results being reported about two-thirds of the time. So we certainly know we have a lot, a long way to go to improve patient safety and reliability. So that's all well and good, but I think it's more helpful to kind of put this into perspective to think about about certain types of events and we learn about these events that happen all over the country but what happens here at Children's Mercy um, so to, just to give you an example of an event that happened here and caused significant harm Cohen is at was at the time a four-month-old little boy with um, George syndrome who was on the floor um, with fevers and infection, and he had an abscess on his um, on his buttock. That the decision was made that it needed to be incised and drained. Now, because of his to George, he also had some pretty significant airway issues, and so the team had decided it would be safest not to do a full sedation on the floor for the procedure, but rather just to give him a dose of fentanyl for pain. Um, as an aside, he had had this done, the same thing done when he was in the neonatal intensive care unit about a month prior and did very well with just fentanyl for pain relief. So the meds were ordered and administered, and shortly after the fentanyl was given, he um, developed apnea and dropped his SAT significantly. Um, they thought that it was due to his floppy airway and some airway issues. And he was um, bagged, though there was some difficulty locating all of the equipment. Had his heart rate drop briefly to the 40s and required CPR for just about a minute. And then he was um, resuscitated. Um, successfully and was actually able to remain on the floor without transfer to the to the ICU though they had to abort the procedure and it wasn't done. 
a few hours later, it was actually realized that the fentanyl that had been ordered, four micrograms, was actually administered at 10 times the dose, and he had gotten 40 micrograms of fentanyl, so 10 mics per kilo instead of the um, intended one microgram per kilo. Um, this is due in part to the particular floors very, very rarely giving such tiny doses. So to draw up four micrograms of fentanyl, that is 0 0.04 milliliters. So teeny, teeny, tiny amount, and it was just drawn up as 0.4. So what we learned from this event was how easy it is to make errors like this. The nurses had double-checked each other on the dosing, but we found at the time that the, the emphasis really for double-checking medications, and especially in narcotics, was much more focused on the waste. Are we wasting the right amount? Is there any risk of diversion? Than truly stopping to think about the safety and is this the correct dose for the patient. So a lot of different um, action items took place after this, um, including some blind double checking. So now when a nurse goes in to, um, to pull out a medication like fentanyl, they actually have, they, the dose is there, but they have to put in the volume also and calculate that and the computer checks against what they, what they determined to be the right amount and some other practices that nursing is starting. So kind of a long-winded explanation, but just to show the very real nature of these events here. So what do patients want um, when it comes to, to care at the hospital or, or in a healthcare organization. Some pretty good extensive studies were done several years ago, and this is what they learned. The most important thing patients and family want is to be kept safe. Secondary, they want to be healed, and the tertiary is to be nice to me. So in this order, keep me safe, heal me, and be nice to me. And when a patient wants to do something we know is unsafe. We explain safety is our top concern, but we don't always do such a good job when they ask us if something is safe to, to relay that as well. So kind of moving on a little bit, when we think about the performance, what performance excellence really looks like in healthcare, Several factors come to mind. So when you look at the blocks in this art, which one's most important here? You know, the keystone is, is always the, um, the most important block in any art. And in performance excell excellence, it's safety. So we know that the best healthcare system, the highest performers, they deliver high quality care in a timely, cost-effective manner that improves patient satisfaction. However, if we harm our patients, all of that is out the window and the whole structure crumbles. So that's why we put so much emphasis on the details of patient safety. So I do want, though, to call your attention to those base stones also. So there at the very base or the foundation holding that whole up our patient and staff satisfaction. And why is that in there? Why is that so important for performance performance? Well, a lot of different studies have been done that show us um, pretty clearly that disengaged physicians and disengaged staff are much, much more likely to make errors they're more likely to take shortcuts. They're more likely to um, not follow guidelines and best practices and really start tilting that arch in a way that it may crumble pretty easily. So, again, you hear a lot of talk at Children's Mercy about play it safe and keep me safe. And 
this is the reason it's that kind of structure hold, holding us all together. So um, I want to spend the next few slides just talking about what is considered the framework for clinical excellence. And this is a framework that has been developed by Alan Frankel and others at the IHI, um, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And I had the opportunity to go train with them for a little while. And it's really, it's really fascinating. And this structure, the framework, really makes a lot of sense when you get into it. So Alan Frankel contends that clinical excellence is made up basically of two organ systems. Um, so he calls those two organ systems culture and the learning system. So the one piece of this puzzle that fall, falls into both the structure and the learning system, or the culture and the learning system, is leadership. And what does leadership mean in this? It basically means facilitating and mentoring teamwork, improvement, respect and psychological safety. So to give an example of, of what this means here at Children's Mercy, you um, may have heard a lot about, um, about changes to leadership, obviously, here right now, but not so much the people, but the foundation of how we think about leadership at this institution. Uh, leadership is now considered, as it should be really the the foundation of, of all that we do to improve um, our care for patients here. So what you've seen or heard at, at Children's probably now is that there are two academies being developed. So there's the Leadership Academy and the Improvement Academy in process. The Leadership Academy is really to help all leaders learn basics and then some more advanced leadership principles um, across the institution. Now as a subset of that there is actually a physician leadership institution being developed as well um, through the Office of Faculty Development and I'm sure you've seen a lot of the different emails for uh, different seminars and lectures and um, and workshops that they are starting to present. And the reason that we're, we're pulling physicians out into the leadership is it is understood that, that there are some different needs there, and physician leadership may look a little bit different in some ways than nursing does. So, um, for instance, many physician leaders are not so much managers, so it's not about filling out time cards or approving vacations as much as coaching and leading. And one of the big um, stresses here is that in many areas, leadership is considered to be a specific title, attached to a specific title or task, whereas the general thought, and in, in certainly true, is that Truly all physicians, all providers are leaders in some way or another. So whether or not you have, even as a fellow, you don't probably don't have a specific medical director of X, Y, or Z or, or title that goes with a leadership position. But when you're in your clinic, um, basically the physicians are considered the leaders of the clinic. You may not get to make all the decisions. The nurses may uh, decide how things are run sometimes, but to the patients and to the staff, we are typically the captains of the ship and leading the boat. So that is pretty much why that is stressed so much. Um, I don't know how many of you have really heard of the concept of psychological safety uh, before, but to me, this is one of the most important puzzle pieces here if we're going to have a, a true culture of safety. So what does psychological psychological safety mean? It, it means that we're living in an environment where people are comfortable and have opportunities to raise questions, um, raise concerns, ask questions. And I, I like to think about it in kind of the, in these forms. So 
if you're truly living in an environment of psychological safety, you feel like you can ask questions. You can ask for feedback. You can be appropriately critical um, and certainly underlining the word appropriately. And you can suggest ideas that are innovative or outside of the box. So if we have true psychological safety, we can have all of these pieces. Now, we talk a lot about that, and these are some of the things that you hear about in the safety training, in the error prevention training modules that everyone is required to take, where you learn about things like SBAR and STAR, Stop, Think, Act, and Review, or the ARC, Ask a Question, Make a Request, Voice a Concern, and Go Up the Chain of Success or a chain of command if you're not successful. So all of these are part of psychological safety and critically important. However, where we sometimes get into trouble is we take psychological safety too far, and the belief is that if I ask a question, I will get my way. Again, remember that feedback is part of that, and along with the ability to ask questions, you have to be held accountable. So accountability is where, where all of patient safety and errors used to happen. So years ago, if an event happened, it was pretty much blamed on an individual because an individual made an error at some point. So in our example with Cohen, that accountability would have been completely on the nurse who administered the wrong dose of fentanyl because it certainly wasn't the physician's fault. They ordered the right amount, correct? Um, but somebody did something wrong. Well, what we know now is there were a lot of things that set that person up to do things wrong. So we really try to look at the system as a whole and we went, so probably 20 years ago, we went from it's always the individual being held responsible to, oh, it's never the individual being held, held responsible. It's always the system. Why did, why did that system make me do that? Well, the pendulum's swinging back a little bit now to what we call a just culture so that there is some individual accountability still that, that's critically important. So in a just culture, really the, the key question that's asked after we get past the, the simple things like, was this malicious, which, you know, is extremely rare. Was this related to substance abuse? The, the things that are truly um, potentially criminal in nature, the next big question comes is what's called the substitution question. So would another person in the same position potentially behave the same way or make the same error? And if that's the case, we really think that it's more likely a systems issue. If it is that no, no one else would do that. The system is set up perfectly and you had to really go around it to do the wrong thing. Then that's an accountability issue. So we, we're thinking about that a lot more strongly than we were just a few, um, five, ten years ago. So questions on that? Okay. The next piece we get to is the teamwork piece. So. This, again, is where some of that um, error prevention um, information comes into play. So I raised a question. I made a request. Now we have to really develop a shared understanding and anticipation of needs. So the nurse comes to me and says, Lisa, did you really want to give um, a dose of Tylenol when they just had some, you know, two hours ago. Now we're stopping to think, okay, gosh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, what would be another better option? And some, some teamwork, that understanding, thinking about the needs that may come up, and then agreeing 
to things. So maybe the Tylenol is not as, as good of an example as, say, um, working up a patient with a fever and, um, and a limp. And the question is, why are we ordering a CT of the, of the hip for a limp? These are the questions that, that as kind of with teamwork and working those things out, we can all come to the shared understanding that, you know what, um, not very long ago I saw a child that presented just like this that had a deep, a deep-seated pelvic abscess, and that was the reason for the limp, and he's presenting just like this. So coming to that shared understanding, which is really part of the next piece as well, which is the negotiation piece. So again, to get the full culture of safety, you have to have all of these pieces into play. Um, and then we can get to, to a true evolution. So this slide is often considered um, the the true evolution of a safety culture. So again, many, many, many hospitals, and not that long ago, most of us were probably at some sort of pathological um, state in safety. So an error was made, but no one, real, no one realized it. A lot of things were kind of, um, kind of just swept under the rug there. So as long as you don't get caught, it doesn't matter. And, and surprisingly, that still exists to some extent. So an example would be um, just within the last couple of months, there was a wrong site surgery that occurred. Um, the error was minor. Um, the incision, it was a, an ophthalmologic surgery, and the incisions on the eye were supposed to be made medially. That was the plan for this particular case. And the first incision, the surgeon made on the lateral side instead of medial. Um, it caused very little harm. It was a small incision, and a stitch was placed quickly, and they moved to the, to the medial side to complete the procedure. Um, but it wasn't mentioned after that. So it wasn't placed in the op note, and the family wasn't informed of that error. And the thought was, it's fine, it's going to heal, it's not really causing harm. But the nursing staff questioned that and said, you know what, we did something wrong. What can we learn from this? Why did that happen? And escalated it. And it was a great learning opportunity for, uh, for the surgeon involved as well as the team. So still a little bit of pathologic happening sometimes. Reactive is where most of us started when we started the safety work, really. Um, when Children's Mercy had 14 serious safety events that first year, we really started doing root cause analyses. So that's the stage where we say, you know, safety is really important. And every time something bad happens, we go crazy. We do interviews. We do all this stuff to try to prevent that exact same thing happening again. Um, we have a lot of meetings about it. We completely change processes. And that's where a lot of hospitals have lived for a really long time. What we're trying to do is move, um, move further up. So a calculative culture now has systems in place to manage all hazards. So an example of that, that's a little bit harder to understand, but an example may be um, there have been some medication errors, so barcode medication scanning happened. So we know that people could pull out the wrong thing or give the wrong thing, so we will just make everyone um, start scanning all of the meds to double-check it. So that's a, a much more global thing. So we're trying to cover all hazards with certain rules. And there are times that that makes sense, but there's times also that it doesn't. And those of you that have been at, at Mercy for um, any period of time realize it's, we have a lot of rules here. And things are rules, but rules based off it. And that, I think, is a, a reflection of, of us being in, in a more calculative area or state. 
So the proactive state is, you know, we work on problems that we still find, but we're still we're still finding problems. So pro in a proactive world, um, we're looking, maybe something bad didn't really happen, but we still find a problem. So these are things um, such as a proactive risk assessment. So through that solutions for patient safety, sometimes that, uh, an example is another hospital had a um, an event, or let's just use one from our hospitals, probably better. So we had an event that was a serious safety event that um, a patient died because of some diagnostic errors in anchoring. So the patient had a ventricular peritoneal shunt and came in with the complaints of fever and dehydration with, and they thought he had gotten overheated. Uh, he acted sometimes, had an altered mental status when he was overheated. So he got some fluids and everyone assumed that that was the case. And what was missed was that his shunt was, even though a CAT scan was done, that didn't show an obvious shunt malfunction. It didn't show dilation of all the ventricles. His shunt actually was not functioning correctly. Um, he had thin slit-like ventricles that couldn't expand um, normally, um, like uh, non-slit-like ventricles do when there is a malfunction. And this child actually, several hours after being admitted to the floor for heat exhaustion, uh, coded and died due to herniation from a shunt malfunction. So for us, we were in very much in the reactive stage on that event and trying to come up with efforts and what can we do to mitigate this happening again. But one of the things that happened out of that was new care process models were created within our institution to help with the assessment of any patient with altered mental status with a VP shunt. So what we did there was then took our event to SPS and pre presented it to all of the other hospitals to say, this is what happened here. How can you learn from it? And then we helped, or help, in the process of helping other hospitals do a proactive risk assessment where they look at what is the likelihood this could happen at their facility also and try to prevent from that standpoint. Um, another example of proactive um, safety culture would be looking at com what we call common cause analysis. So we look at all of our event reports and say, are there, even though there may not be bad harm, are there trends that could lead to harm? Are we seeing any patterns there that we can learn learn from the small things before we have a big thing. Uh, we can, we have the ability within our event report system to cut and slice those events in, in lots and lots of different ways. We can look at the event type, so say um, contraindicated medication. We can look at mislabeled lab specimens. We can look at it from the type. We can look at it from the location that the events occurred. We can look at it from the underlying cause of the concern. Lots of different ways to kind of slice and dice to figure out ways to proactively prevent events. And then ideally, we'll hit the generative stage where we're really, it's just our way of working. We're in a high reliability state that, that it's, it's not, it's, safety isn't what we do, it's who we are. Um, in a generative state, one of the things we, we look at is, is doing some deeper dives on things that went well. So the traditional root cause analysis is done when there is an event that harm occurs and we are looking for why it happened, what contributing factors were there, and how we can prevent it. In a truly generative uh, fashion, we take an event that went absolutely perfectly and do the exact same thing and say, why did this go so well? Is it because of the particular individuals involved? 
Was it because our system is so great or did we just get lucky and the stars align appropriately? So is this a reproducible um, good event or is it just by chance? So that's kind of a lot on the culture. Then we look a little bit at the framework for clinical excellence. And this is more really falling more into kind of the QI work. So we won't spend as much time on that since we're talking primarily about safety. And I know you all have um, fellows QI projects to, to do and you're learning about that as well through them. So the um, improvement side of thing is, again, it's continuous learning. So we're collecting and learning from our successes and our defects as well. It is improvement in measuring. So it's really hard to, to truly improve a process if you're not measuring it and having some good, um, good clear data on what, uh, what effects your changes are having. So this is really our, the PDSA cycle of let's plan, um, let's institute something, and then let's study it, and then assess it again. So reliability um, comes in now. So we've done this, and now we're going to apply the best evidence to minimize non-patient-specific variation with the goal of being failure-free. So many of the, the safety gurus, lean experts, will all tell you that, as, as you well know, we are not um, the nuclear power plant industry, we are not airlines, we will have variation every single day. When we, um, in the nuclear power plant, when you push a certain button or move a certain lever, the machine is going to behave the same every single time. In medicine, as you know, when you push a certain lever or button, when you give a certain medication, when you try a certain procedure, the human isn't going to respond. Each human isn't going to respond the same way necessarily. And in fact, each child may not respond the same way from day to day with the same interaction. So the best we can do in medicine is to try to eliminate all of the variation that is not patient specific. And that's truly the goal. Um, there when we're talking about it. That's why all CPGs, the G stands for guideline. There has to be some ability to adapt based on the patient-specific needs. And then the next piece, and this is one that really gets lost sometimes, is transparency. So again, when we get this data, when we learn from this, we have to be transparent and share it in a way that's safe, respectful, and reliable with staff, with partners, with families, so that we can all be on the same page. So, again, kind of long-winded to get through this framework, but I think it's nice to really kind of see how all those pieces fall together. So, question, um, here at Children's Mercy, are we there yet? Do we have that truly safe, reliable, um, process that we that is exactly where we want it to be. Um, obviously, the answer is no. Um, we will be there when we have zero harm. Um, a lot of of the safety world talks about striving for zero harm, or goal of zero, or aim for zero. And in reality, we understand that that may not be completely achievable. It may not be realistic to hit zero harm. But we are dealing with people's lives. And if our goal isn't zero, we're probably in the wrong, in the wrong area. So we may not be there, but we're certainly getting better and improving, um, improving that safety, um, safety profile. So what are our statistics here at Children? So when we look at event reports or RL reports, we receive about 9,000 annually. And we'll talk a little bit more about what happens with those in a moment. Um, last year was our lowest year 
to date for serious safety events, we had five, though I wouldn't, and that's fiscal year. So I wouldn't 100% close that out just yet because we're only in July and sometimes we learn about events that happened a couple of months ago um, as, as they become a little bit more obvious. Uh, last year we had one SSE1, which is a serious safety event that led to death that was thought to be preventable. So that particular patient um, was a, uh, a young baby with a, a tracheostomy on the floor who had a very complex medical history, including um, primarily epidermal lysis, bullosa, and a lot of sloughing of skin, airway, et cetera. And due to his condition, it was difficult to monitor, to place monitors on him. Um, any stickers, any adhesives would result in sloughing on his skin. So after he had his tracheostomy placed because of sloughing in the airway also and significant airway compromise. But after he um, had that done and was thought to be stable and he went out to the floor, the decision was made not to keep him on continuous monitoring because of his skin condition. And uh, long story short, he plugged his trach and it was not recognized in a timely fashion because there were no um, monitors and he was also not in a medical one-to-one -one position, or a medical one-to-one. -one. So that root cause analysis led to some, some process changes as well. And the question wasn't, was it a bad decision not to have him on continuous CR monitoring? What it really came down to was, if a patient's condition is such that continuous electronic monitoring doesn't make sense, we need to talk about it. So, for instance, in the, in the PICU, they had come up with a way, talking with dermatology, to keep a SAP probe on him, at least, that didn't seem to be causing him as much harm. Um, and in addition, we instituted, um, changed the policies for monitoring so that if a patient who normally would meet guidelines for continuous monitoring, such as a tracheostomy patient, any patient being sedated for a procedure, um, patients on certain medications, if they could not have continuous monitoring because of their condition, they would be placed in a medical one-to-one -one so that someone would get the bedside um, In addition to our five serious safety events, though, there were 15 total cases that were escalated through clinical safety in some way. So these were cases which may not have met the criteria for a serious safety event, but the potential was there or the process seemed so broken that it was felt that it would be best to still do a deeper dive and look for improvement. In the perfect world, all of the cases will be, will be those, but we're not there quite yet. So how do, how do we hear about these events? We hear about them lots of different ways, and I'm not going to, to read them all. You can, you can read perfectly. But as a general rule, about 20 to 25 events per day come through the event reporting system. Uh, we'll talk about daily safety update in a couple minutes. I get a lot of information just via email or, um, or drive-bys in the hallway. Uh, people want to uh, stop and, and chat about something. Um, we hear about them through the patient advocates, and then there's also a clinical safety, uh, safety physician on call every day. So what happens with those event reports? Um, every day, the clinical safety team huddles and looks at every single event report that is submitted. And a couple of things happen. One, we can say, let's just get feedback from the leaders in those areas and, and see what we need to do. Or there may be something concerning that says, you know what, let's review this a little bit further. So we may just meet, need more information. Um, the event report may say that the patient had harm from the event, or we may need to think about charge reversal. So through an event, when would that happen? If we see, for instance, um, an x-ray on the right arm was ordered, but it was really supposed to be the left arm, and so they had to have another a, se a second x-ray done. That's a pretty 
simple example of a time that we would reverse charges for the um, incorrect one. And then we also look at, at events that may need urgent evaluation. So, for example, a serious medication error um, would be an example of that. And as an aside, um, the little event that I told you about before, Cohen, that would, occurred in March of 2018. And that is the last serious safety event related to a medication error that has happened at Children's Mercy. So we've gone over a year without a serious medication event. Um, really much, much due to work that pharmacy did, but also from the root cause analysis there. And then um, in that daily huddle, we also follow up on events from, from DSU that may have come up that need further um, classification. So I'll get to these next slides pretty quickly, but one of the things that I've learned um, when I started my work in, in patient safety was that a serious safety event is really a definition specifically. And this is something that's not really well understood throughout the institution. So a serious safety event there is, is a very specific definition. So a lot of events that are very serious do not qualify. And a lot of events that or true safety issues don't qualify. And so what I mean by that is for it to be a serious safety event, it the issue, it has to reach the patient and it has to result in moderate harm, moderate to severe harm or death. So for instance, a, an event that occurred a couple of years ago um, revolved around simultaneous trauma activations in the emergency department. So two teenagers came in at the same time with um, significant injuries from actually the same motor vehicle accident. And the patient number two was ended up needing to go to the operating room prior to patient number one. Everyone thought that number one would would be the most severe and would need interventions the most quickly. But it turned out that it was patient number two. So he went to the operating room, was bleeding profusely, and they called for blood. Um, someone went to pick up the blood and said, I need blood on the trauma patient, and it was released. And as the second unit was hung, it was realized that the blood that was hung for patient number two was actually blood that had been intended for patient number one. So he got the wrong blood. Now, the reason this it didn't end up being a serious safety event is it just so happened that those two patients had the same blood type. They were both A positive, and so there was no harm to this particular patient. However, it was thought to be a very, very serious event and a safety event. It just didn't hit the serious safety event definition. So a full root cause analysis was done to say, how do we prevent this from ever happening again? Um, because we just got lucky here. I sometimes think that the, those are the, the type of events that we kind of call the pucker events or the who, well, we just got lucky. So that's what it takes to be the serious safety event. A precursor safety event also reaches the patient but it just causes minimal to no detectable harm or unknown harm. So an example here may be um, a, a patient who um, gets a, an antibiotic that is contraindicated because they have an allergy. They're allergic to it, and they have a small allergic reaction but not anaphylaxis. So there, there's harm there, but it's contained and it's easily treated. And then a near miss event is one that the error occurs, but it doesn't reach the patient. So it may be caught by a barrier that we have in place or just by chance. So I think, um, I'll skip this one because I think this one makes more sense. So this is the algorithm we use to determine that. So is there a deviation? This is where the error comes in. Is there a deviation from generally accepted performance standards? So in the safety world, we say, was there a gap? So did something happen 
not as intended or deviating from the norm? If the answer is no, it's not a safety event. So we have patients that, that may actually um, die in our institution, but we don't find a specific gap. Sometimes it is a progression of illness. It is um, patient factor related or something like that. So if there is a gap, did it reach the patient? If it didn't, as we said, it's not, it's a near miss safety event. If it did, then we ask the question of, did it cause moderate to severe harm or death? And that's how we determine if it's precursor or a serious safety event. So this, it sounds pretty straightforward, but it's really, really difficult to learn to tell sometimes. And it especially happens when we find gaps and we know there are problems in the system or things that went wrong, but can we tie that gap or that event specifically to the outcome? So uh, an example of that um, may be a patient who, um, who code, this is an, an event that we had. So a patient coded in interventional radiology and during that code um, there were some some best practices probably not followed one the child should have had the procedure done in the ICU because he was quite ill two um, the medications were ordered by the radiologist and anesthesia was not involved and the patient did code he was resuscitated but then in the ICU, he ultimately passed away. So he had an event and he died actually within 24 hours. Um, and it was considered a serious safety event, but it was not considered a serious safety event, number one, that the events causing death because this child had a fatal disease anyway and he, it was thought that he probably was not going to live more than a couple more days but the process was escalated by the events. So a little hard to, to really describe, but that hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So what we're going for in safety is, and every one of you have heard the Swiss cheese model um, many, many times, uh, kind of talking about all of the errors lining up for, for it to get through. But the key really here is safety is a dynamic non-event. So we will never know how many events we prevented. What we'll know is how many we didn't have, and if that makes any sense. So we'll always know what we have in the numbers, but hopefully we are preventing way, way more than we could ever be aware of. Because any time that the harm reaches a child, it's, it's a mistake at some point there. So what do we do with these events, the root cause analysis? And um, I don't think... Um, many of you have had the opportunity to be involved with an RCA here at Children's Mercy, but what an RCA is, is it's just a structured problem-solving technique that the goal is to create some corrective actions to prevent recurrence. So what happens with a root cause analysis is we start, it's typically a three-meeting process. We start with interviews before the first meeting, and we talk to all of the people involved directly and the reason we do that is to kind of create a timeline and get multiple different perspectives um, that you can't get from looking at the medical record. From that, we put a timeline together and look to see if there are gaps. Sometimes we don't know if there are gaps or not. and We don't know exactly if this was preventable. But, but if there's an unexpected event, we look at it to help determine that. Then the first meeting is to look at the timeline and determine gaps. And then the second meeting is to try to figure out the root cause there. So an example um, on, the, on the fentanyl cases, you know, the gap was that the nurse pulled up the wrong medication. But when we really got to the root causes, what we learned was that our current system just did not have good, reliable method for double-checking those doses. 
So then once we determine what the root causes are, then we create some action items with owners and timelines to try to help um, mitigate that and prevent further occurrences. So root causes, what, what do we find? Primarily in clinical safety, we're looking for systems-related causes. Again, the focus is not so much on the individual, though we do hold, them, hold some accountability. And the systems-related causes primarily we find are policy-related. There may not be a good policy. There may not be a good process. Um, there may be too much reliance on an EMR that's not functioning um, as we hoped it might. Those are some communication is a, is a common um, system-related. And then we find a lot of cognitive bias. And when you look at cognitive biases, there are over 50 different types, but these are the three that we see the most often. So um, anchoring, which is the tendency to rely too heavily on one piece of information. So the CBC is normal. It must not be an infection. Let's move to the next thing. Confirmation bias is looking for information that, concern, that confirms your preconceptions. So confirmation bias happened in our VP shunt case that we looked at. The, the CT was read as normal. Okay, good. I didn't think it was the shunt. Let's move on when really, um, really that wasn't the case. And then the availability heuristic is overestimating the likelihood of an event more readily available in one's memory. So going to, um, to something that you're familiar with instead of thinking about um, what if it's not which is my favorite question to ask um, the residents. So quickly, and I know we're at time. So these are just some examples of the things that Mercy is doing to try to improve patient safety right now. Um, leader rounding GEMBA are going to the place where work is done. You'll, you should see leaders a lot more present um, around, and Paul Kempinski is a great example of that. He may show up anywhere, any day to ask questions about about safety and processes. Um, safety training, I'm sure you have all done error prevention training um, since you got here. Our great catch program and safety coaches. Many units, all of the inpatient nursing units now have safety coaches. So some folks that are trained specifically to help identify um, good and bad safety practices. Um, the lean process is, is certainly um, aimed at reliability. That's our whole entire goal of lean is being highly reliable and safe. Um, cause analysis training. So we're training people to think more about all of those events and, and figure out the buckets and where they could be. And then our, our huddles, um, all of our level huddles, but our daily safety update and then the executive huddle um, as well. So daily safety update. And I think Sometime in the next couple of weeks, um, we have a, a fellows conference where we'll, we'll all dial into daily safety update and go through this. But, but what does that really do? So, so DSU is, is 15 to 20 minutes a day. Um, and it's basically a venue where we, we check the state of the house. What do we need? What's missing? What are we not prepared for? And then what may have happened um, that could present safety issues or risk to our patients? Um, ideally, identified at problem solving and um, uncovering problems uh, that may exist so that we can work to prevent them. Uh, just this month, we updated our, our daily safety update to what we're calling 3.0, which is much more focused on, on REDS than any other thing. So instead of every single area checking in and saying we're good today, we're really just calling out um, where aren't we good, what problems do we need to, un to surface, and what can we do to escalate or to solve those. So I encourage you to come by DSU someday if you, ha if you happen to be free at 9, 10, because it's really kind of an interesting process to watch um, uh, the interactions between all of the clinical and non-clinical areas of the hospital. So what do we learn from it? We see trends. We find out communication issues. We learn about shortages, about critical staffing, about process issues and problems. 
And to date, we have um, closed over a couple of thousand of um, projects or problems that have raised through DSU. So um, are we there yet? No. Are we Honestly, are we ever going to be there? Probably not, but we're always going to strive to get there. So future plans, um, again, the safety event reports continue to improve follow-up because I, I do know and I understand one of the, the issues that people have with putting in an RL report is I put it in and then what? So we're really trying, the clinical safety team is working hard to try to come up with more reliable ways to give feedback to the people that raise the questions. And some of that is in sharing safety stories more globally. Um, we are oh, piloting today, actually, part of a new course that will be focused on disclosure. So as physicians, when an event happens, how do I talk to the family about this? When do I talk to them? What should I say? What should I not say? Um, we talked a little bit about the safety 2.0, which is that proactive safety, so learning from the things that went well and increasing our family engagement with these. So I'm sorry, I know we went a little bit over. Um, we probably don't have a lot of time for questions, but if people have anything, you can certainly um, give me a call, send me an email, um, ask for clarification.